On April 24, 1980, 20-year-old Robin Brooks finished her late shift and headed home. The next day, she failed to join her friends for a swim they had planned together, raising their concerns. Worried, her friends and co-workers visited her apartment to check on her. When they finally entered, they were met with a sight that would haunt them forever. Robin was born in Fort Lee, Virginia in 1960, but spent the better part of her life in Highlands, New York. She was a happy, cheery lady who was adored by her family. Maria Arick, Robin's elder sister, had remarked that she didn't have fear, unlike me. I was a bit more concerned and cautious. As Robin turned 19 years old, she decided to move to Sacramento with Maria. She had always wished to try something new, and moving to Sacramento seemed like the perfect opportunity. The two sisters adjusted nicely to their new home. During that time, Maria fell in love and started seeing Norbert Holston. Their relationship started struggling due to Norbert's well-documented anger control issues. It also affected his relationship with Robin, which contributed to the two sisters' decision to live separately. Maria, on the other hand, was anxious about her own safety and did not feel at ease living alone. However, when she expressed her concerns to Robin, it just led to disagreements between the two. I was her older sister, and I always felt like the protector. When she moved here, she was merely enjoying herself. She was twenty years old, Maria stated. Robin worked in a donut shop on Kiefer Boulevard, just a few blocks from her house. She did not own a vehicle, so she got accustomed to walking from her flat to the shop and return when her shift would end. Robin seemed to be fulfilled and at ease with her life in Sacramento. Unfortunately, it didn't last long. On April 24, 1980, Robin worked the late shift until around midnight. She was eager to go home. Later, a co-worker of hers at the donut shop, Joan Olson, would recall that day and mention she had stripped the bed and carried out the laundry before she arrived at work. And she also made a joke about how it wasn't fair that she had to make the bed at night time. As soon as Robin got off work, she went home. Unbeknownst to her, it was the last time she would be seen alive. The next day, Robin, along with a few of her friends, had plans to go for a swim. Nevertheless, she did not accompany them, and her absence seemed strange. Moreover, Robin's shift at the donut shop was scheduled to begin at four o'clock, and she didn't show up there as well. Her co-workers got worried about her absence as it was unusual for her to miss work without notice. When she failed to show up, some of the co-workers went to her flat to find out what was going on. When they got there, they discovered that Robin's front door was locked. She did not respond, even after they banged on the door multiple times and called her name. Their minds began to race with a series of disturbing thoughts, they realized that in order to find out whether or not she was inside the flat, they would have to get inside. Right away, with the assistance from the flat supervisor, they forced open the front door, entering a suspiciously quiet home. Afraid of something terrible, they made their way to the bedroom and were taken aback by what they saw. Robin Brooks' dead body lying there in the middle of a leaky waterbed. She had died from strangulation and stab wounds. It was an extremely unsettling scene. Robin's co-workers immediately reported the incident to the authorities. Not long after, detectives from the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department showed up. An autopsy was conducted which revealed that Robin was assaulted sexually before being stabbed five times. One of the stab wounds penetrated her heart. From her body, the perpetrator's DNA was also recovered. Additionally, blood that was not Robin's was found splattered on the wall of her apartment. This led authorities to believe that the perpetrator accidentally hurt himself whilst attacking Robin. Furthermore, fingerprints from a person whose identity wasn't known but believed to be the assailant were found on Robin's flat's windowsill. 
detectives deduced that whomever took Robin's life most likely came through the window. At the time, it looked like that this evidence would be sufficient to identify and apprehend the suspect, but this proved not to be true. Back then, the technology was not advanced enough to assist them in their investigation. As a result, months and years went by, yet there wasn't any progress in the case. Eventually the case became cold, and Robin's killer continued to be on the loose. In 2004, over 24 years after Robin's untimely passing, there had been a major breakthrough in the case. Using advanced forensic techniques, detectives were able to extract a DNA profile from the perpetrator's blood. This fresh discovery gave the detectives something more tangible to work with, and they were hopeful that the assailant would now be caught soon. A number of individuals, believed to be related to the subject, were tested, but there wasn't a single match. These circumstances exacerbated detectives' frustration. In an interview, Detective Mickey Lynx, who had left retirement to focus on the investigation full-time, claimed that it is very frustrating because we have our suspect. We have his DNA and it's a full profile. We know who he is. All we need is his name. We need to find out who he is. In 2017, the investigation took a surprising turn. The investigators were able to make out the suspect's likely appearance. DNA phenotyping, a forensic technique, allows for this by using DNA extracted from sperm, blood, or other bodily fluids to establish the physical traits of an unidentified person. This technique can determine physical traits such as height, skin tone, hair color, and much more. In the case of Robin's killer, investigators managed to create two composite sketches. The first depicted him as he would have looked like at the age of 25, while the second depicted him as he would seem at the age of 56. These two profiles were made public in the hopes that somebody might recognize the perpetrator and come forward with the crucial info. However, authorities were let down, since nothing came of it. Following that, in 2020, investigators used a DNA search technique known as genetic genealogy in order to get the answer. This method is quite effective and has been employed in capturing many perpetrators. Investigators used this technique to piece together the facts and track down Robin's killer. In the end, they identified a man named Philip Lee Wilson as Robin's killer. After the incident, Wilson had continued to live in Sacramento. He had been right beneath the authorities' noses the entire time and they had no clue of it. On April 23, 2020, Wilson was officially arrested for the crime committed four decades earlier. At the time, he was 71 years old. He was held without bond and charged with one count of murder. However, he maintained that he was innocent and the case went to trial. The trial took place about two years after he was arrested. Wilson's DNA was discovered to be a precise match to the blood splashed on Robin's flat's wall in 1980. Based on the prosecution's evidence, his prints matched those found on the apartment's window sill. Wilson's lawyer, Thomas Clinkenbeard, did not dispute the presence of Wilson's DNA. He did, however, claim that Wilson and Robin were acquainted and were engaged in consensual sexual activity on the day of the slaying. Clinkenbeard likewise provided an explanation for how Wilson's blood ended up in Robin's flat. He described the circumstances by stating that Wilson had sustained a workplace injury. On top of that, Clinkenbeard attributed Robin's death on Maria's ex-boyfriend Norbert. He depicted Norbert as a violent and temperamental individual whom Maria was terrified of. He said before the jury that in the days leading up to Robin's murder, Norbert and Maria had gotten into an altercation, which escalated to the point that Norbert threatened to kill both Maria and Robin. Clinkenbeard claimed that Norbert had lived up to this threat by taking Robin's life. This allegation, however, was disproven by Maria's testimony. 
She stated in court that Norbert was with her on the evening of the incident. Norbert could not testify in person given that he departed a long time ago. Following a trial that lasted for a whole decade, the jury reviewed the case. March 9, 2022, on Wilson's 73rd birthday, they declared him guilty of the murder charge. Over a month after being ruled as guilty, Wilson was sentenced to life in prison with no hope of release. Maria was both pleased and relieved when she heard the news. After so many years, the case was eventually solved, and she received the closure she sought. I feel like I can move on with my life now. Maria believes that the case took away a part of who she was. On January 24, 1980, a 23-year-old nursing student named Mary Robin Walter was discovered deceased in her trailer in Great Bend, Kansas, a small city roughly a 100 miles northwest of Wichita. The young mother of one had sustained multiple gunshot wounds. Despite early suspicion falling on her neighbor, Stephen L. Hanks, lack of evidence prevented an arrest. The case went cold for decades, described by Brian Bellandier, who was appointed as an officer for Barton County in 1982, as a haunting chapter in the department's history. On Thursday, January 24, 1980, around 6.50 p.m., the sheriff's office got a call from a person reporting a murder. The address provided was RR 1 Lot 9 in the Nelson Trailer Park. This happened nearly a decade before Barton County had locator addresses or a 911 system. The crime took place close to the intersection of SW 40th Ave and Anchor Way, which is nearby the Great Bend Municipal Airport Complex. The trailer park do not exist anymore. When deputies and detectives arrived at the crime scene, they were met with the body of a woman with multiple gunshot wounds. The sheriff's office was aided in its investigation by other law enforcement agencies, including the Kansas Bureau of Investigation and the Great Bend Police Department. The next day, Dr. Edward Jones performed an autopsy. As per the findings, Jones confirmed 17 bullet wounds, most of which were potentially fatal. He removed nine bullets from her body. The state presented evidence that the rounds were from a 22 semi-automatic Ruger pistol that belonged to Douglas Walter and was discovered in a dresser drawer within his bedroom. It was noticed that firing that many shots would have required reloading the weapon. Witnesses were interviewed on multiple occasions, and many leads were followed up on. Even after a significant amount of data was acquired and a person of interest, Stephen Hanks, had emerged, the case was abandoned. Sadly, he could not be prosecuted due to lack of conclusive evidence. Many investigators have investigated the case over the years, but none have been able to unearth anything that could have helped in prosecution. In April 2022, following his recovery from the pandemic, Detective Sergeant Adam Hales of the Barton County Sheriff's Office revisited the Mary Robin Walters case. Looking over the case again, it was made clear that certain details had been missed at first, whereas some had been added at a later date. The initially assigned detectives were not aware of this. After looking at the case along with Sergeant Hales, the remaining two detectives, Detective Alex Lomas and Detective Brian Volkel, besides Patrol Sergeant Travis Doe's, were requested to be allocated to the case. Lieutenant David Payden oversaw the whole thing. In 1980s, multiple people who were linked to the case were located by the sheriff's office, and multiple interviews were carried out as far away as the Pacific Northwest. KBI, who helped with the investigation, was consulted at numerous occasions. In October 2022, fresh evidence came to light, allowing the sheriff's office to pass on the case to Barton County Attorney Levi Morris for consideration. Following roughly four weeks of research, 
Mr. Morris secured an arrest warrant for 68 years old Stephen L. Hanks of Burden, Kansas, for second degree murder. Back then, Hanks happened to be the victim's neighbor. On December 8, 2022, investigators from the Kansas Bureau of Investigation apprehended Hanks in Oxford, Kansas. Agents handed Hanks over to Loot David Payden and Detective Sergeant Adam Hales, who took him back to the Barden County Prison. During the interview, Hales remarked that there weren't any indication of a forcible entry into the Walter residence, and questioned Hanks what it meant. Hale explained that she must have let him inside herself. Pointing to his notes of Hanks' responses, I inquired, This was an accident, right? said Hales, to which Hanks replied with a nod. As per the reports, Hanks informed the detectives that Walter was dressed in a bathrobe, which seemed to be consistent with the recorded evidence, and then he accompanied her towards the bedroom, where she drew the gun out from the dresser. Hales claimed in a subsequent interview, Hanks informed him that the victim had been engaged in fellatio with him at first, but then she bit him and took the gun from the dresser. When asked what actually transpired after the first shot was fired, well, it scared the heck out of me, Hank remarked, thereby turning over to his army training. He had no idea what made her to reach for the gun. During the second interview, Hanks confessed to the authorities that he had been battling alcoholism in 1980, but had been sober for 41 years. Could it be said that this would not have occurred if you hadn't been drinking? Hales questioned. That's fair, he answered. They questioned him if he felt that the victim's daughter, Pam Walter, who was six years old in 1980, should be having closure. She deserves it. Hanks allegedly informed Hales that what happened at that time was not intended. During the third interview, while on the drive to prison, Hales questioned Hanks about whether he had ever considered speaking with the authorities. He claimed that, even though he had given it some thought, but didn't want to give up on his independence and everything he had fought so hard for. He asserted that Walter was the first to reach for the weapon. She was the one who tried to use it on me. I tried to get away, but my instincts took control. Still, him being in her bedroom didn't make any sense to the detectives. He stated that he was invited back to the bedroom by the victim herself. During the fourth interview at the Barton County Sheriff's Office, after being informed of his right to stay silent, Hanks mentioned about his cancer treatment in front of Hales and expressed his desire to avoid dying behind bars. According to reports, he said to Hales, I have been doing time for the last forty-two years, looking over my shoulder. She was about to take my life. At this point in his statement, Hales discussed of the latest DNA evidence and a sketch from a year later, back when Hanks was being looked into. The sketch's sources were not disclosed, but Hales claimed it had a sexual theme and depicted a man pointing a gun towards the head of a woman. He stated that he questioned Hanks whether it was him replaying what happened. He replied, it may have been on my mind. According to Hales, Hank's DNA sample was recovered from Mary Walter's mouth. This breakthrough was made possible by the relatively new MVAC technology. Authorities had to send the sample for analysis to a private facility in Florida. This wasn't the first time Hanks had ran into trouble with law. In 1981, Hanks was taken into custody as he was accused of assault, aggravated burglary, and aggravated robbery. As per the Kansas Department of Corrections records, he was kept on probation until 1993 and then granted parole in 1991. Hanks is presently incarcerated in lieu of a $500,000 bond. This is believed to be the oldest homicide arrest in the history of the state of Kansas, spanning over a time period of 42 years and 10 months ago. It might be among the oldest slayings in American history to be ended in an arrest. Additionally, this eliminates the last recorded killing 
in a non-incorporated region that is under the Barton County Sheriff's Office's jurisdiction. Following the breakthrough in the case, Leslie Schrag, the niece of Mary Robin Walter, expressed gratitude from herself and her family's behalf to the investigators for their efforts to bring Robin's killer to justice in a statement she sent out. Schrag stated, Robin was truly beautiful inside and out. Her absence from this world left us in the dark about how her loss affected us. The news of the arrest was bittersweet. Sadly, there weren't many people left in the world who knew Robin. Her parents' husband and sister didn't have the chance to feel that closure upon her case's resolution. As we saw that throughout the investigation, Hanks has given conflicting accounts of the events that led to Mary's death, from self-defense claims to blaming the victim. Yet his apparent lack of remorse and insistence on his innocence raise critical questions. What are your thoughts on this case? Share them in the comment section below.